Assalamu alaikum. My name is Sue Obeidi, and I am the director of the Muslim Public Affairs Council's Hollywood Bureau. And I am joined by Dr. Evelyn Esselkani, Associate Professor at USC's Dorn Sykes College. We are here with Nida Mansour, creator, director, and writer of We Are Lady Parts, which can be watched on Peacock. We Are Lady Parts is a bold comedy that celebrates the richness and diversity found in contemporary London. It explores the fundamental questions that we ask ourselves every single day. Who am I? Where and with whom do I belong? But ultimately, it's about women with real agency forging their own lives and identities in a world that is determined to do it for them. Nida, we are so excited to be talking to you today. We love the show. We have watched it several times, binge watched it several mm -hmm. times. And thank you and congratulations on the success of the series, We Are Lady Parts. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. I'm so thrilled you liked it. And I want to chime in and also say how much I loved it. And the day <laughs> that Peacock released it, I planned to watch one episode in the morning, but I ended up watching the whole thing in the morning. And then that evening, I made my husband sit down and watch it again. So I watched it the whole thing twice in one day. <laughs> and then Sue and I wrote an op-ed about it. We were so excited. And then I went to Spotify and kept listening to Bashir with a good beer because it cracks me up and it just makes me happy. So thank you. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. absolutely. And, and the poems in the, in the series are amazing, very moving. Um, the nine to five, song by Dolly Parton. I mean, I never heard nine to five sung that way. And that was so amazing. I, I, congratulations. And thank you is what I want to keep saying. Congratulations. And thank you. Um, we'll just start with a quick question just to rewind. Tell us about the inspiration and how you came up with Lady Part. We are Lady Parts. Oh, absolutely. No, thank you so much for your kind words. It's so, so nice to hear it from, from both of you. Thank you. Um, so the idea for the show, I think, came about because I was feeling a sense of frustration with the kinds of representation of Muslim women that I was seeing, um, and also that I was being asked to write. Um, I'd had a few interviews um, as a new writer where I was being asked to kind of look at the, sort of the tragedy of what it means to be a Muslim woman. I was being asked to write, you know, um, things about like honor killing and forced marriages as though that was the norm um, and the sort of, yeah, the norm of experience. So. I was very um, keen when I was sort of reflecting um, myself to create something that I felt could, you know, reflected who I was and the women I knew. And, and so that's when, that kind of is what drove me to, to come up with the show, We Are Lady Parts, um, and to think of these characters because, you know, it was so important for me to write a show that showed a kind of a breadth of Muslim women um, expressing themselves differently, but none of whom are having a crisis of faith. Um, I wanted to show them with joy and humor, but also with kind of complexity and darkness as well. Um, so that's what the show allowed me to do. Um, and, and I feel so lucky that I was able to make it. Well, we're so lucky that you, you did make it, you know, so thank you for that. Um, Evelyn, did you have a follow up question on that? Yes. We have so, so much I, to ask you actually. A lot. I should also tell you that I cried out of happiness because I'd never seen any anything like it in my life. I was like sobbing of joy to see these women in the car together singing. It was amazing. What something I'm curious about. So Sue and I created this test, the Obedi Al Sultani test, and it specifically targets Hollywood writers and producers who are trying to do something different in this age of diversity. And I'm wondering we think that there's been a shift in the US media. I don't know the UK media's situation. But there's been a shift here partially promoted or prompted by Trump's Muslim ban that people were very upset about it. And there was an expansion in representations of Muslims as a result. And there's still a lot of missteps and mistakes. And it's just the very beginning. But I'm wondering if in the UK context, if you think something happened to allow for this show now, that mm -hmm. perhaps five or 10 years ago, we don't want that show, we want the oppressed Muslim women. But now we're open to it. So I'm wondering if there's something similar happening in the UK or if you think that there was something socially or politically that allowed for this show to finally, for us to have this show now? Hmm. You know, I can't think of um, a sort of one thing in the way that the, the Muslim ban that you speak of um, prompted um, certain shows. You know, I, 
I was seeing maybe a, a couple of um, Muslim men getting shows made that that were that was interesting. And, you know, in the comedy space, there's a show over here called Man Like Mabeen, um, which is really lovely. Um, I I can't think of any one thing. What I did do, however, when I was pitching the show, I kind of did a lot of the heavy lifting of development kind of on my own. So when I was taking it around, I had a pretty fleshed out idea, you know, um, idea of what I wanted the show to be in terms of who the characters were, um, what I wanted the tone to be and how I wanted to say that. So I was able to kind of then take that around to different production companies and see who chimed with it and who would really kind of enable me to do it the way I wanted to do it. Um, and so that that is where I found Working Title and um, my producer there, Syrian Fletch-Jones, just immediately got it and helped. And then we then tried to find the right home for it. So it was actually more a case of trying to find the right people um, to who would who would allow allow me to make the show the way I wanted to make it. And that actually was quite freeing because I could just navigate and just kind of quick, quite quickly kind of say no or to just take it away when because it means so much to me and I wanted it to, to be a comedy. Um, and that was also something that people were like, oh, OK, because they again having Muslim women in a comedy wasn't something that not everyone was was game for so you know I don't I can't think of an external thing but it was mm. actually more I, I really felt that I was trying to find the right team and you know we, we got in with channel four and the our comedy execs there seemed to also very much support what I wanted to do and I, I don't know um I do feel very lucky because I do feel that you know if it was even a few years before I'm not sure I would have got the the green light for the show. I feel like there is something in the time, but I can't really point to one sort of moment. That's awesome. I have a follow up question. As you were pitching and and create, you know, producing, were you getting any pushback about maybe adding old tropes into the storyline and story arcs or? You, you know, it happens a lot, you know, when it's so perfect that sometimes, you know, suggestions are made to kind of make it, you know, less authentic. Were you getting any kind of that feedback? Yeah, a little bit when I, and, and that was what was so interesting because for me, it was a, a test for me to see how companies reacted to my, to the show. If they were like, oh, maybe it should be more dramatic. Maybe it's too silly. And it's like, no, 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 I want it to be silly. We're not, we're not allowed to be silly um or you know actually most of the thing was wanting it to be more serious or maybe we should go a bit darker here and it's like mm, that yeah it, it it really quickly enabled me to kind of take it off the table from from places that I didn't think were really getting it you know and it was just really wonderful when I met Syrian because she was just like yes I want to make this show that you've written that that's here um and she really you know embraced it so I felt very lucky Actually, you know, it was quite weird because I'm I'm a new writer, so it was strange to have this sort of kind of confidence to say no to companies that were interested. But I, you know, it's that thing when it's so important to you um, and you want to do it right, and I'd rather not do it than do it wrong. Um, and that really kind of emboldened me to to say no to people, um, maybe in a way that I wouldn't for other ideas that didn't have that personal connection. That's awesome. That responsibility is such an honor. So thank you for staying true to the, to the storyline, to the, to your experiences and to the, to, to the characters. You know, I, I do want to say something personal. Um, growing up in LA, my family was one of the first families that opened up a halal meat shop mm -hmm. um, here and actually in Orange County. Um, and yeah, and I was Syrah. I was the one, you know, cutting, you know, it was chicken, halal chicken, you know, but with my dad and mom, you know, so it is so authentic and thank you for staying true to it. Really appreciate it. Thank you. So I wanna take you through the five criteria of our test. And I wanna preface by saying your show doesn't need a test, but it's instructive for others. And I'm a professor, so you know, it's a lesson for others mm -hmm. to learn because we are far from getting to the point where we don't need tests and criteria and suggestions. And mm -hmm. so the first of our um, criterion is to move away from old tropes because we've noticed there's a tendency that even writers and producers who are trying to do something different will recreate the terrorist story but in a new way or let's not do terrorism we're going to do exoticism we're going to remake sinbad or 
And so one of our suggestions is to move away from that. And it seems that what's so powerful about We Are Lady Parts are the universal themes. And so I was wondering if you would talk about that, that perhaps that is instructive for people who want to do better representations of Muslims to think about universal themes. So in this case, these women, their agency, trying not to be who other people want them to be, but finding out their own voice and who they are. Mm. No, yeah, absolutely. You know, I really wanted their faith to be just an aspect of who they were, not their defining characteristic. Um, and that they are, you know, they're a band and they want to get gigs is sort of enough. And that it's that very, as well as like women who want to have their voice and have their voice heard. And, you know, I got, I felt like I wanted it to be universal. Um, and it wasn't like, I, you you know, we don't have to reach for that. It's just the, the truth of, of who you are. So in a way it was so freeing to be able to write you know, these women just being people. <laughs> and it, it felt so, you know, so right. And so, so um, for me, just actually, it's, it's, it was like the first time I felt I could really express myself in this really honest and open and way that was just really nourishing for me as a writer, as I was doing it. Um, and that I think comes a lot to, as you were saying, being able to explore the universal themes of, you know, finding your place in the world and figuring out who you are and, and being in conflict with your friends. Um, so that was all, you know, really, really lovely. So, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's really important. But, you know, having said that, you know, if we do see characters can have a crisis of, of faith, but it's just making sure that that isn't everything, I suppose. Um, yeah. yeah. One of the things that struck out about all the characters that, that, that as, as hard as, you know, their experiences were whatever they were dealing with, whether it was Amina with the whole, you know, marriage thing and, and, and her best friend who, you know, very judgmental by the way, and, and, and you know, um, Syrah and her parents, and we find out, you know, her sister, you know, died of leukemia. They were still all very comfortable in their skin, mm -hmm. in their skins, that, that, that was really, that was also stuck out and it was, it was so inviting and so new to us here that, again, you know, thank you and congratulations. So, really, that that, that was just another thing I wanted to point out. Oh. And we can all we can identify with all the characters when we were writing the op-ed. Mm -hmm. uh, we were saying, should we add who we identify with the most? And we couldn't, you know, nail one character. I mean, I I think I'm Syrah, but 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 I, we couldn't really decide because mm -hmm. we all there's every there's something in all of that you know mm, yeah oh. anyway thank you I mean it's really interesting what you say about sort of inhabiting their own skin I also one of the things I realized when I look back on it what I was doing is wanting to show these women in different spaces and like and also spaces we don't often see them in and there's something about you know, seeing these Muslim women doing a gig in a pub or being out in the countryside you know where oftentimes it doesn't feel like that's where we belong or we should be and allowing these women to be wherever they want to be. And again, that was something that I realized is quite important to me just as a writer when I feel my own discomfort in certain spaces when I feel like, you know, maybe the space isn't for me and, you know, through the characters allow them to own own different spaces that sometimes we internalize as not being our own. Evelyn and I talk real, and I know we're going to get to the second um, criterion, but Evelyn and I talk a lot about the conflation of culture and, and, and the faith itself mm -hmm. and how much, the, how much baggage we bring along of culture, because a lot of it is culture that, like you said, we, you know, are conscious of where we are because sometimes Muslim women aren't meant to, you know, or any Muslim, or, you know, is meant to be at a bar, for example, but the reality is that's where sometimes our friends hang out, you know, and, and you know, so that was so authentic as well yeah i'm going to skip to our third criterion and then i'll get back to the second because you were talking about characters who are not defined by religion and that's one of our criterion since there are so many characters it says if there's a lack of imagination to think about muslims beyond religion and having religion just be one part of who you are and what i really loved was mumtaz it's a nikabi She's an incredible character. We never even get to see her face. And I also love Amina's parents and her mom. 
who is not pushing her to get married and wants her to enjoy her life. So such mm -hmm. refreshing portrayals. I was wondering if you could talk more about Montaz in particular and about, you know, perhaps the parents or any of the other characters and how you went about uh, portraying them. Absolutely, yeah. Montaz is a character very close to my heart. Um, I was inspired by this Nikabi artist um, who I spoke to quite a lot as I was sort of coming up with the character. Um, and I, you know, I just said to her, like, part of me really wants to not really, we don't really see her because I want the audience to be able to fall in love with her and not be like, I need to, you need to be uncovered for me to connect to you. It's like, no, she can wear whatever she wants to wear. And because of what she's saying and who she is, you connect to, you will connect to her and to really to kind of explore that. And that was something that I discussed with this artist. And, we, and it's felt like such an exciting thing to, to bring to the screen, um, you know, as well as her being sort of the backbone of the band who sort of leads them to their ultimate success and brings them back together. So it was really, for me, exciting to, to, to get to, you know, to get to show her. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, as you said, the parents were just so much fun to write and to direct. They're, they're just, you know, just again, not being overbearing parents is this, that, that trope that we see. I, I, didn't, I didn't want to do that. You know, I was really inspired by my own parents who, you know, they're not like totally like, out there, but they don't have to be. They're just, you know, they're quite silly and loving and it was a, it's a warm family environment. I think it's, that's one of the things I realize is missing from what I've seen of Muslim representation. There's a lack of like warmth in the home. Like, you know, the, the expectation is that at home it's all like doom and gloom and you need to run away from it rather than a place that could possibly be nurturing. Um, so that's really something that I was keen to show. With, I just want to jump in with one of my favorite lines with the parents because they definitely shatter stereotypes, right? Mm -hmm. With when the father um, said something like when she threw the poster of Don McLean in the trash, and then he he was saying something like it could be argued that it's hot on to throw you know Don McLean in the trash. That was classic. And then there there was a show in the '80s in America called Home Improvement with mm -hmm. Tim Allen, and there was a neighbor. Yeah. And this, we never saw the neighbor's full face because the neighbor was always covered by the fence. And so Tim's character would, always, so what you did with Montez was just literally class, like, class, like it was just for those who lived in that era and know what I'm talking about, know that we fell in love with the neighbor without knowing what he looked like, without really seeing his, you know, the exterior. So, you know, again, great job on that too. I love home improvement. Oh, just okay. Add. So you do know the show. Okay. I, I, I was wondering if you were too young to know the show, but that's good. Okay. Montaz is amazing. I think it's so yeah. groundbreaking. I don't think we've ever seen anything like that before. And, and I want to know, like in season 10, will there, will there be a big reveal? You know, that's what I want to know. Consider it. Maybe. Oh, you'll have to. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> So our second criterion is to have a Muslim identifying writer on the staff. You are the lead writer, so uh, clearly that was done. Uh, but one of the things we're trying to encourage in the industry is not just to tack on a consultant at the end, but to have someone as part of your team as that can really enhance the process and the outcome. And so I'm wondering what your team was like. Yeah. So. I had a writer's room for, had, not in the sort of traditional American sense, it was a sort of two day writer's room um, where I brought in, you know, there was a group of Muslim writers, not Muslim, non-Muslim, but like different um, backgrounds, um, poets, artists, basically writers who essentially are my peers or people who I, you know, whose work I really admire to sort of talk about the characters and really kind of I, I'd written the storylines out and just really discussed these storylines with these other creatives um, who are from that background. So it was like quite, it was only a couple of days because like, but but it was also just a really kind of nourishing and, and lovely environment to, to be in um, and to allow, you know, and to allow them to, to kind of discuss the characters with, with people who are like me. And it, it just, it kind of empowered me in a way. Because um, I knew with series one that because of, you know, it's quite short, six half hours. And I was very much kind of finding my feet with what I wanted to say that I would write the show. But then to have that opportunity to talk it through with other sort of young Muslim writers was really cool. 
So we have two more uh, criterion that we want to get your take on. One is having Muslims as a strong presence in the storyline rather than adding in the background, because there's a tendency to start to diversify by adding in the background and then that character is not essential to the storyline. It's nice, it's good, it's not bad, but we want to get to actually know Muslim characters and obviously your show has five Muslim women at the center of the show. Uh, and you have told us a little bit about um, these women, but I don't know if there's anything else you want to add about what it means to have five women at the center of a show who are Muslim. Yeah, it's interesting when you have, so it stops being a thing really because they are friends. They don't have to, you know, explain why they're Muslim to each other. They kind of, they are who they are. So the stories kind of become about them as, as friends and as kind of different kinds of women. So it, it is just, it doesn't feel like a thing when, you know, when I was doing it, it didn't, it's so lovely to hear you talk about it as, as being groundbreaking, but when, when you're just having fun writing your friends, it sort of feels like quite a, um, a natural and normal thing to do, I suppose. I just hope like maybe we just get get more of it. It is a thing, Nada. I mean, it is a thing. You did it so elegantly and and class. I mean, it was very classy and and almost like with with some. It's never been done before. It, it literally has never been done before. And so, the common thread in the series is the love of their faith and the love for each other and in their families. And, but we don't come, it's not on the nose. And, you know, and so that is what I think balances it all out and brings it to the top that you love them because of who they are. But then when you really think about it, it's just, you, you wanna be best friends with each and every one of them. Mm. And that is not, that's what we're talking about. That's the groundbreaking. Mm. That we're talking about that's the out of the ballpark um mm. storytelling that you were able to do um because we don't walk around i mean i know you know i'll speak for myself i don't walk around with a slam on my sleeve you know but i live it and that's what these characters did and in, in one of the episodes when the um when the influencer you know uh misrepresented who they were, they fought hard and, mm. and they were staunch about how much they loved the faith and how it was represented in that in that article. So anyway, I just want you to know that that was no small thing. And and so again, I just need you to know that. Thank you. And to have Noor, the friend, be the one that's more observant and following certain rules. And then Aisha's queer and it's just not a big deal. It's just, of course, some, you know, for one out of a bunch are queer. So it's just such a refreshing, the whole thing is a refreshing portrayal. Our fifth and final criterion uh, is to portray Muslims as the, the diverse group that they are. And so there's a tendency to portray Muslims as Arab and Arabs are 20% uh, of the Muslim community, maybe 15%. And in the US context, 20% of the community here is African-American. Uh, so we really love the diverse cast of characters that you had, Arab and South Asian and African. So that was really wonderful. So I wanted to ask you about that, but also when Sue and I were coming up with this uh, test, we often talk about casting in terms of ethnicity, but not in terms of religion. So mm -hmm. if this were a test about Arab representation or Middle Eastern, North African representation, we would have insisted that characters should be matched to their ethnicity, but with religion, it's much more complicated and Muslims are of all backgrounds. So we didn't say you have to cast a Muslim to play a Muslim, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's a question mark. It would inform a character if mm -hmm. they were Muslim playing a Muslim. So I'm wondering also about how you went about casting, to what extent it mattered if the actual actors are Muslim and those kinds of questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um... You know, casting was such an exciting part of the the um, process is finding the right people to to play the parts, and you know it was very ex extensive. And I, I remember when we we did a lot of um, chemistry reads because I really think the show, you know, is dependent on that group of women at the heart of it, really believing believably being this sort of punk group of friends, and 
you know, for me, it was finding the right cast who could do not only the comedy, but also be believably punk and work together in the ensemble. So, you know, I was really trying to find actors who could most truthfully represent the kind of nuances of the personalities of each of the characters, because as you say, it's sort of wanting those, those nuances really have to sing quickly in quite a short space of time. So it was, it, you know, it was brilliant because we were just finding, we're just slowly piecing together this group where they all bounce off each other and they each have a different energy. And, and as well, you know, as you say, what was important to me that it was like a di diverse group of, of women so as you say, it's not just, for example, North African or Arab, it was, you know, wanting South Asian and African. And I wanted that because again, that was what I'd known and what I'd seen. So I just wanted to be able to, to bring that to the screen. And, you know, I worked really, really closely with my costume designer, PC Williams, and how we styled each of the characters. You know, a lot of what Aisha wears, for example, is, you know, informed by her being Iraqi, um, and like how do each of the characters wear their hijabs and their carbs? And we were like thinking stylistically, what's their personality, you know? And also where are they from? How would they bring that? You know, how do they express their femininity? You know, for example, Syra, we have, we had, she had about 12 bits of costume and that was it because we are like, you know what? She doesn't overthink. She's just, just wears the same shirt again and again. She had one pair of jeans, we did minimal makeup. So it was really thinking like, who are they? And, can we get a sense of who they are immediately and can they work together? Um, and that was really, really, really fun and exciting. That's awesome. So Nida, if you could do one thing over again with oh. the show, the mm -hmm. series, what mm -hmm. would it be? If you could do it all over again, what would you either omit or add? Mm. That's, a, that's such an interesting, would I omit? Or add or change. Add. Ooh. You know, it's maybe a cop out answer. I wish I I hadn't been so hard on myself um, through it. And I, I realized this from speaking to other writers, other new Muslim writers, you know, women writers as well. This kind of, you know, we feel this burden of responsibility and we carry it and it sometimes can be, um, you know, debilitating when you're trying to write something and, and you're worried constantly about, are you doing it wrong? Are you not quite getting it? Could you be doing it better? And I was quite tough on myself at times to the point where I, you know, I'd not write for a few days because I would be so racked with worry of messing it up. Um, because I feel like, you know, we are creating art at a time where the culture will, you know, will come down on you. Um, and I've really heard that from other new writers who sometimes the questions I get are like, how do you write how how you know with the worry of not upsetting you know be it your parents or your friends or that auntie down the road or just what you internalize think what people will say even if it actually doesn't quite represent the truth of what people will say so you know for me it was just 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 hope wishing i was just a bit more chill <laughs> um and it's so lovely and heartwarming to see it be received so you know so warmly and just having young women really, really respond to it has meant the world to me. Um, and I really feel like what I want to do is encourage other writers from, you know, marginalized groups who who can sometimes wear that burden and it, it can it can stop you and just to be encouraging of, of them. Um, yeah. So you can incorporate that in season, from season two to 10. So be more, <laughs> exactly. be more chill. So be what's next? <laughs> what's next for you what's what's next is there going to be a season two where are you at with that what are we expecting here you know fingers crossed um still waiting to see if we get a series two um I would love to I think there's so much yet to be explored with these characters and you know possibilities are kind of endless with them so I'm really excited to to dive into that um I'm working on a film at the moment which you know we'll see if, if it if it goes ahead but I'm just sort of rewriting a a, a movie um but yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm up to. Well, God willing, we'll see a season two, yeah, to ten. Well, can you talk a little about the feature, or is it is it still in the early stages? I mean, it's still quite in the in the early stages, but again, it's quite it's a comedy with a lot of action. It's sort of an action an action comedy, but again, set in a sort of British Pakistani family. Um, so it's again playing with with genre. Um, 
but with characters that we maybe not don't usually get to see in the those genres. Wonderful, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess with that, we just want to say thank you again, congratulations again, and we look forward to pretty much anything by Nida Mansoor. <laughs> uh, so then, and also I want to thank our friends at Peacock um, and NBC Universal for reaching out to us. Uh, we, you know, we're just so excited to be part of this um, journey with We Are Lady Parts. It's definitely a momentous occasion for us. If you are not watching, you have not watched the show, you drop everything and, and binge watch it. You are going to love it. I, I, I think I said it enough and you know, I can't underscore it enough. This is so refreshing and we are so happy for you Nida and for really honestly, to be honest with you, you know, Muslim narratives, period. Thank you. Yes. Thank you Nida. Thank you. Pleasure so to meet you. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you.